Well, good morning, and if you're, you're visiting with us today, my name's Christian, I'm one of the elders here at Cornerstone. I get the opportunity to teach, usually share the preaching load with Todd, our senior pastor who is on sabbatical. He'll be coming back in just a couple more weeks, so excited to have him back and hear about the, the refreshing, uh, hopefully the refreshing work that the Lord did in his life while he was gone. But we're going through the book of Matthew. We've titled this series, Apprenticing with Jesus through the book of Matthew, because I think that's a great idea of what discipleship, to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, is all about. Apprentices don't just consume information, they, they learn through practice, they learn by doing the things they see their master doing. And that's what we're seeking to do as we go through this book together. Again, the ushers were coming by, if you need a Bible, you can uh, grab one from them. If not, go ahead and open up to Matthew chapter 13. We, in Matthew chapter 13, we find a collection of Jesus's parables, these, these metaphor, symbolic stories that Jesus told. I love the way that John put it last week. They're, they're earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. Last week, John took us through the parable of the sower, this, this story of a sower who throws seeds on different kind of soil. And Jesus told this parable and he explained it to his disciples to illustrate the different responses that people were having to his message, that the kingdom of God had arrived with him. Some were just kind of on the fence, didn't do anything with it. Some like they received it with joy at first and petered out or, or, or withered and died along the way. Others rejected him outright and actually are seeking to destroy him, but others were that good fruit that Jesus talked about. We also talked about the way that in this point in Jesus' ministry, as he shifts from more open teaching to these more like veiled, obscure parables, he does it for a number of really important reasons. We've looked at this over the last couple of weeks, this idea that Jesus shifts to parables on the one hand to obscure the truth from the crowds, the people who've been hearing his message and failing to respond. He says, now I'm gonna to speak to them in parables because their hearts have grown dull and though they hear, they don't hear. Though they see, they don't see. They don't understand. And so they are only going to get parables. And yet in the same token, these same parables that obscure the truth from the crowds reveal, illustrate the truth for his disciples. Not because they just were the smarter, uh, uh, the sharper tools in the shed or anything like that, but because they came to Jesus for explanation. They had already positioned their lives to be followers of Jesus, to, to learn from him, be led by him. And so it mattered to them to understand. And it wasn't only that they wanted to know what these parables were all about, they needed to know. The whole purpose of Jesus training them as disciples was that they, they would join him as fishers of men, as disciple makers themselves. They need to use this information. And I would say to us in the same way, if you are a disciple, a follower of Jesus, you need to both understand and use the information that Jesus is communicating to us here in these parables. There's one more uh, principle that we've seen with these parables, and it's this. Jesus is also communicating with parables to address that gap between people's expectations for how God's kingdom would come and the reality of the way that Jesus was bringing it. We talked about how that, that whole gap between expectation and reality is kind of the main theme of chapters 11, 12, and 13 of Matthew. And that's another reason why Jesus is doing it. We're going to see that especially in the two parables that we're going to look at this morning. We're going to look at the parable that's called the parable of the wheat and the weeds. You may know it as the wheat and the tares. That's an old English word. I, I don't know it. So we'll go with wheat and the weeds. That works for me. And then also the parable of the net. They're two parables that illustrate a very similar picture. If the parable of the sower last week was a little bit more, more individual and oriented, it's talking about different individual responses to the message. These two parables this week are kind of big picture parables. They look at the way that the kingdom of God is operating within the world as a whole, both now and in the future. So if you, again, I know you got comfy sitting for just a second, but we're going to read this passage together. And I would ask if you are able, if you want to stand with me, we're going to read from a couple different places in Matthew chapter 13. You can follow along on the screens. I'll cue you where to go. We'll skip over a few of the parables that next week Mike Seinwender will be walking us through next week. So come back for that. But we're going to start in Matthew chapter 13, verse 24. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, 
Did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. If you're following along in your Bible, skip down to verse 36 where Jesus explains this parable. Then he left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons or the children of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will, gather, they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now skip down to verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So will it be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right, heavy stuff. Fiery furnaces, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Final judgment, that's, that's what these two parables are about. But hopefully even just by reading through them this morning, you see the similarities between both of them. Because both of these parables are not only talking about that future ultimate judgment, but also a present reality of the kingdom of God at work too, right? Do you see that? There's both a present focus and a future focus. Presently in the first one, the kingdom of God in this world looks like wheat and weeds growing up together at the same time. It looks like a, a net, a big fishing net that's gathering all kinds of fish. In the future will be the time of the harvest to separate the two from each other. That's when the net will be pulled in and the, the fish will be shorted, sorted out. Do you see that? Here's what I want you to get as we, as we dive into this. That present and future dynamic of the kingdom, that thing we were just singing about, that God's kingdom is both coming and here at work already, that's the big reveal in these parables. That's the big truth that Jesus is revealing for his disciples, I would say, clearer than at any point up to this point in the biblical story. That there is a way in which the kingdom of God is at work now and a way that it will come later. We often talk about it with this, this phrase, already and not yet. You familiar with that? That there's an alreadiness to the kingdom of God that we participate in now, but the fullness is not yet. It still awaits the future. That's the big reveal in these parables because that is different than what the disciples were expecting it seems they truly, most of the Jewish people expected the kingdom of God to come with immediate overwhelming force. But again, Jesus is giving them these parables to address that gap. You were expecting this, but here's the reality. Not that your expectations were wrong, but they're incomplete. Let me give you more detail about the way that this is going to work. So here's what I wanna do. We're gonna deal a little bit more with the parable of the wheat and weeds and we'll refer to the one about the fish and the net. We're just gonna deal with the wheat and the weeds because there's more explanation. There's more content on that one, but hopefully you see the similarity, two ways of making the same point. So let's dive into the way that Jesus explains this parable in verse 36. Take a look right here. 
Again, we see that same pattern again. The crowds get the parable. The disciples get the explanation of it. They're the ones who need to know what this is all about. And the way that Jesus begins to describe this, it's almost like he, before he explains like the, the story of the parable, he gives them a glossary of terms. You see that? In all these verses, he's just saying, here's what all of these things refer to. And I think in bullet points, my notes right now are always, everything's in bullet points in my mind. So I made bullet points of this. It was helpful to me. It might be for you as well. I want to touch on a couple of these details as we dive into the significance of this. First off, when Jesus talks about this one who sows, plants good seed in his field, he says it's the son of man. We know Jesus is referring to himself throughout the book of Matthew, throughout all the gospels. This is Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself with this title, the son of man. We'll talk more about the significance of that title in just a minute. But first, okay, the son of man is Jesus. The enemy, the one on the other hand who sows bad seed, is who? The devil. Again, a reminder from Jesus to his disciples, the main enemy that I've come to confront isn't just corrupt human rulers. They're way down on the totem pole. Like they need to be dealt with and they will be dealt with, but the main enemy I'm here to confront is the evil one, the devil. The one that... that, that Paul talks about in Ephesians 2 as the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Those who live in rebellion, who have not turned and trusted and followed Jesus. That's who the weeds are in the parable. The sons are the children of the evil one. Those who, because they're not a part of God's kingdom, are part of Satan's kingdom. Now, here's the interesting thing about these weeds. Every commentator that I looked at as I was studying for this, they mentioned this same type of weed called, called darnel that most likely is what Jesus had in mind because when darnel first starts to grow, it looks identical to wheat sprouts. Like you literally can't tell the difference. It's not until it starts to produce heads of grain that you can tell the difference by looking at the heads of grain. And it's really important to tell the difference because darnel will actually make you sick if you eat it. This matters. This isn't just, ew, that's gross stuff. Get it out of here. No, it's like one is good and pleasant. One is harmful to people. But you can't tell the difference until the heads of grain develop. Did you see that in the parable, right? The enemy comes and sows the weeds, and it's as they grow up and developed heads of grain, then the the servants went, whoa, what happened, master? I thought you put good stuff down here. You can't tell until the fruit becomes evident. But at that point, that the heads of grain are evident, you can tell the wheat from the weeds, what you don't see is that under the surface, all the roots are interconnected and intertwined and entangled around each other. So when the servants say to the master, do you want us to just go pull up the weeds? He says, don't do that because you'll end up unrooting the wheat right along with it. Here's the best thing to do. Let them both grow up together until the harvest and then we'll sort it out. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Now, one other detail I think is really important. We can get into all of them. But that second bullet point there, the field that Jesus is talking about here, he identifies the field as the world. The Greek word is the cosmos, the, the, the inhabited world, the, wor- the ordered world. You could even say the world order, the way that the world works right now. That's what he's talking about. That's significant because maybe even you're familiar with this. Throughout history, it has been really common to take this parable and make it about the church, about the community of disciples. And when you do that, basically, this parable parable becomes a warning of like Judas type people. Those who look like they're one of us until at a certain point, their true colors are shown. A warning of imposters, saying that imposters will be mixed into the church until Jesus returns. Now, I would say this. I think that idea is true. I just don't think it's what this parable is about. There are many other places in the book of Matthew that do hit on this idea of imposters within the community of Jesus followers. Like, remember back when we were in the Sermon on the Mount? In Matthew chapter 7, one of the things that Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, he says, Beware of false prophets who come into you like wolves in sheep's clothing. They look like you on the outside, but they are very different on the inside. And he says, by their fruit, the outcome of their lives, you'll you'll be able to tell the difference. Just a little bit later, he says to him again, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only who? Those who 
do the will of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus is clearly calling us as followers of Jesus not to be judgmental like fruit inspectors who are all about just trying to determine who's in and who's out, but to beware that there may be those who think they're part of this or want us to think that they're part of this and really aren't. Later on in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus is going to give some extended instructions of how we as a church family are meant to operate when there is one among us who is unwilling to turn from a clear pattern of sin in their life, even to that point of separating ourselves from them. Those passages, Matthew 7, 18, are clearly about what does it look like to have purity and authenticity within the church? But here in Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, this is about the world. This is about the way that the kingdom of God is at work within the world as a whole. And Jesus says it's going to look like a mixture of wheat and weeds until the harvest when I'll sort it out. Again, this is new information for the disciples. But Jesus links it with old information that they've had for several generations. Look at the very next uh, part of it. What verse? Verse 40. Again, we, we, I read through this just a second ago, so I won't read it again. But as Jesus talks about the way the harvest is going to play out, pay attention to those words up there that I highlighted because they're really significant. Each one of these words factors significantly in the Old Testament prophetic book of Daniel. Did you know that? I think Jesus is doing that on purpose. He is linking what he's teaching the disciples through this parable here with the vision of the kingdom of God that, that was there in Daniel. He's not correcting errors in what Daniel saw, but what he's doing is that, hey, what Daniel saw from afar, now that we're here, let me zoom in and show you the detail of the way this is going to work out. But again, maybe this sounds familiar to you. But again, if you're, I would encourage you, if you, as you study the Bible over this next week, as you do your own personal reading, if you're not familiar with some of these passages in Daniel, I would say, jot it down, make a note if you take notes, and go back and read some of these. That phrase, son of man, the whole reason why Jesus uses this as his favorite title for himself is because of the way that Daniel uses it in Daniel chapter 7, which we'll look at in just a moment. Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7 have two of the biggest, most important visions of the kingdom of God in the Old Testament. I think that's the background of what Jesus is talking about here. Maybe for some of us, the most familiar one is that phrase, fiery furnace. You remember a story from Daniel about a fiery furnace and three friends? You remember their names? See, you can pronounce Bible names. Don't be intimidated. You can do it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Again, he's using this language. Even that phrase, shine like the sun. There's a vision that Daniel is given of the future resurrection at the very end of the book of Daniel where it talks about those who sleep in the dust of the earth, those who are dead being awakened, raised to life again, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. But then he says, the righteous, they will shine like the brightness of the sky above. Jesus is very purposefully linking this parable with language from Daniel because he's cluing his disciples in. Here's what, you, here's what I'm doing. This parable is connected. I am expanding upon, commenting on, giving more detail to the vision of the kingdom of God that Daniel gave you so that you're able to adjust your expectations to the reality of what I'm doing. Go with me for a bit. We're going to spend just a couple of minutes looking at these visions from the book of Daniel. We'll just be able to summarize them now. And again, I would, I would encourage you to go back. They're, they're fascinating stories. But let's see if I can just summarize this quickly you can, so you can see the way that what we have in Daniel would have been the main picture in the disciples' mind. And Jesus says, that's not wrong, but let me add to it. Does that make sense? Daniel chapter 2, check it out. Daniel chapter 2 is the classic story of Nebuchadnezzar having this dream of this massive image, this giant statue that's made up of four different kinds of metals. And then he sees this rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, that comes and strikes the statue at its feet, and the whole thing crumbles and turns to dust and blows away, and then that rock becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar's freaked out by this. He called all of his magicians and stuff to try to interpret the dream, but he says, I'm not even going to tell you what the dream is. You have to tell me what the dream is and the interpretation, or I'll kill y'all. And Daniel goes, Lord, could you help, please? <laughs> this does not sound like a safe situation. And the Lord both gives Daniel the dream and the interpretation of it. 
And as he explains it to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, hey, this statue that you see, the four different kinds of metal, it represents four different human kingdoms or empires. Nebuchadnezzar, you, the, the king of Babylon, you're the, the head of gold, the first one. But after you will come this succession of three more kingdoms or empires. And then after the fourth one comes, this rock representing God's kingdom will crush them all and fill the earth. Four kingdoms and God's kingdom. Look at the, again, particularly in verse 44 of Daniel 2. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. This is about 600 BC at this time, 600 years before the time of Jesus. This is that initial vision given, four kingdoms, then God's kingdom. About 50 years later, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel himself receives a vision. That has a very similar pattern to it. Not a statue made out of four different kinds of metal, but he sees these four grotesque, monstrous beasts kind of parade before him in this vision that he sees in the night. And again, he's told in the explanation, each of these beasts represents a different, twisted, corrupted human kingdom empire that will come through the scene. But then, in chapter 7, after those four beasts go past, look at what he sees. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Ding, ding, ding. Son of man. One like a son of man. In, in Daniel's vision, what it means is this. After seeing all these grotesque, monstrous beasts go by, then I saw someone who just, saw someone who just looked human. He looked like a human man, and then he was brought before the Ancient of Days, God himself, and was presented before God, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Again, four kingdoms then God's kingdom, and in particular, the, the level of detail that Daniel 7 adds is that kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God, is entrusted to one man to rule it. But then, as the vision is explained to Daniel, just a couple verses later, check out this. Again, the four beasts are four kings that will arise out of the earth. But then the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess it forever and ever. In the vision, it's one man brought before God to receive the kingdom. But in the way that it's going to play out, it's not just that one man, but the people of God who are going to join in that rule. Does that make sense? So again, you look at these two images, which Jesus, these visions, which Jesus is linking his parable to, and here's the big picture expectation for God's kingdom that the people of Israel would have had in the first century. There's going to be these four temporary corrupt human kingdoms, but then God's eternal kingdom is going to come into play. And this one, this son of man, this human king will be given rule over the kingdom and those who are God's people, his saints, his holy ones, they will share in it. That's the big idea. Now, if you're familiar with the way that history played out from that time in the, in the 600 BC forward, you know that after Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, the next kingdom to kind of take things over was the Medes and the Persian, the Medo-Persian Empire. That's kind of number two. Then the Medo-Persian Empire eventually fell to this dude named Alexander the Great who just mowed through the area and beat up everybody and set up, didn't last for very long, but he set up what we call the Greek Empire. Then after the Greeks kind of imploded, the people that came in and filled that vacuum of power were the Romans, the Roman Empire, the biggest and longest lasting empire. Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the wilderness in the land of Judea, a Roman territory, there's this dude that comes on the scene dressed in a camel hair coat saying, guys, listen up, it's time. The kingdom of heaven's at hand. We're living in that fourth kingdom time period. It is time for that son of man to arrive on the scene. We call him the Messiah and he's coming and he's got an ax in his hand to chop down the trees that don't bear good fruit. He's got a winnowing fork in his hand to separate the wheat from the chaff. He's bringing the harvest. 
It's time for everything that we've expected from Daniel to come. It's time. And then a little bit later, this guy named Jesus kind of picks up the mantle from John the Baptist with the same message. It's time. The kingdom of heaven is here. Repent, believe the good news. And what does Jesus keep referring to himself as? The son of man. I'm that guy. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm the one who's going to be brought before the most high to be given the kingdom to rule forever and ever. Come be a part of what I'm doing. And in the people's mind, at least initially, it's sweet. This dude's the rock that's going to crush everybody else and grow into a mountain that's going to fill the earth, right? That's what Daniel 2 talked about. Except then the way that Jesus acts as the Son of Man doesn't seem anything like a rock ready to crush people, does he? He comes humbly. His kingdom is simple, as we sang a few minutes ago. He comes teaching and healing, and and not in prominent cities and places of power, in these kind of podunk towns around Galilee. Why are you doing it that way, right? Just a rabbi training disciples. Again, it's backwards, at least to the way that the people were expecting the Son of Man, the Messiah, to come. We even saw that back in chapter 11. It gets to the point where even John the Baptist himself, who prepared the way for Jesus, ends up sending messengers to Jesus to go, hey, are are you the right guy? Should we be looking for somebody else? These parables are given to address that exact question. Jesus says, yes. I am the son of man. I will rule as king forever. My kingdom will outlast all others and last forever. My people will share in that rule with me. I will sort out the good fish from the bad. I will bring destruction to those who persist in rebellion against me. And I will bring salvation and deliverance and a final permanent home with me to those who trust me. But not yet. Right now, that rock that's going to crush all kingdoms, it looks like wheat and weeds growing up in the same field. It looks like a net gathering good fish and bad fish. As Michael show us next week, that rock that becomes a mountain and fills the earth starts like a little tiny mustard seed. But it is the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of heaven that will eradicate all evil and evildoers and make all things new. It's going to happen. But for now, it doesn't quite work like that. I guess you could say this. Uh, I was going to make a prettier version of this and I ran out of time. I apologize. I basically just scanned this from a book. I guess what you could say, the, the expectation that the people of Israel would have had in the first century was this. There is that old age they're living in, dominated by Satan and sin and death and corruption. And when Messiah comes, they're gonna, he's going to flip the script. He is going to enter in that age to come dominated by righteousness and knowledge of God and love and joy. It's going to be a quick flip over because again, when you look at Daniel 2 and 7, that's what it seems like. Four kingdoms, then God's kingdom just mows everybody down and rules forever. But what Jesus goes on to explain to his disciples is that no, actually, there's an overlap. The kingdom of God looks like the MasterCard logo, if you will, a Venn diagram. There's an overlap in the middle. The kingdom of God really is here at work already, but not yet in its fullness. And in that in-between time, in that overlap of the ages, the children of the kingdom and the children of the evil one are intermixed and intertwined. And Jesus, as the master says, that's the best way for this to play out. Not only so that way The good stuff isn't uprooted with the bad, but because I have a mission for that good seed to do while they wait for the fullness of the kingdom to come. I have good work for them to do. But make no mistake, even though he's saying this is coming in a way you didn't expect. You didn't expect wheat and weeds. You didn't expect good and bad fish in the same net. You expected me to come in, clean house, take names, and just set things up. But don't worry. That harvest... That end of the age, that final judgment, it is coming. 
That's why both of these parables emphasize that. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age, when it is time for that full transition from the old age to the age to come. Those who continue in their rebellion against God. I I love Kat. Check out those two phrases I put in bold. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom, pull them out of his kingdom, all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and then throw them into that fiery furnace. On the flip side, verse 43, the righteous, the righteous, those who are right, who conduct themselves with honesty and integrity and truth. Do any of us do that perfectly? I don't. The righteous, again, we see clearly through the teaching of the New Testament, those who are truly righteous in God's sight isn't because we worked it out on our own. The way that Paul talks about it in the book of Romans chapter three, there is a righteousness from God apart from obedience to the law, but it's what the law and the prophets were always talking about, a righteousness that comes through faith, through turning and trusting and following Jesus. That's what it means to be made righteous by God's grace through trust in Jesus. Those righteous ones will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. That is coming. It's not here yet. Oh, how we long to breathe the air of heaven. I don't know what the atmosphere of that is going to be like. But gosh, don't you want that? Isn't all creation groaning? There's a new creation coming. Isn't it good we remind ourselves of this so we don't get lulled into complacency here? Or just get so fed up with the tension of living like wheat among weeds that we just go, fine, I'm going to take my ball and go home and live in the mountains by myself. We are called to wait patiently and to work faithfully in this in between. Here's what I want to do in our last few minutes to go together. I just want to talk through some, some points of application, okay? Because again, this, these parables were novel concepts. This really was paradigm shifting information for the disciples. Wait, there's this overlap. There's an already not yetness to the kingdom of God. We got to wrap our minds around that. Maybe for some of us, that's not quite as new of a concept, partly in fact, because we have had this parable in our Bibles for the last 2,000 years. But I think if we're honest, the reality is we all need the words of Jesus here to recalibrate our expectations for life. Both our expectations for what the future will be like and what our present lives should be like. And that's what I want to think through with you guys for the last few minutes. Do you remember earlier this year, again, when we were in the Sermon on the Mount? We spent about four months teaching through the Sermon on the Mount in chapters five, six, and seven. And we kept coming back to this idea, that the main point of Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount was to teach his disciples what it means to live as citizens of God's kingdom among the kingdoms of this world. In John 17, he actually prays to the Father on our behalf, and he says, Father, they're not part of this world any more than I am. Not like we're aliens from another planet, but like they're not part of this world system. They're part of the world to come. That's their true home. But I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world. I'm praying that you would protect them from the evil one because they have work to do in this world. So I want to talk a little bit about that because I would almost say that whole idea of living as citizens of God's kingdom among the kingdoms of this world, you could also phrase it this way. It's what it means to live as wheat among weeds. That's where we are and where we are supposed to be. So I want to go through these four points over these next couple minutes with you guys. What does it mean for us to live faithfully as citizens of God's kingdom, as wheat, even though we're surrounded by weeds? I would say the first thing is this. It means that we are called to live differently, but not separately from the world around us. Let them both grow up together until the harvest is what Jesus says. We are called to live differently, not separately. But I think it's also essential that we think carefully about what it means to live differently. Because sometimes we all all know those people who seems like they want to be different just to be different. We call them weird, don't we? (laughs) 
Isn't that often what the world thinks of us as followers? Wow, what y'all do is weird. Oh, last week you shopped at that store and now you don't. That's weird. Oh, you watched those movies before. Now you don't. That's weird. Sometimes the difference we want to make, again, is just those consumeristic, materialistic things. Oh, I won't shop there anymore. I won't see that movie anymore. But we should all go see this movie. Not necessarily saying that that's bad, but is that really the difference that makes a difference? If your desire to live differently as a Christian within this world is about fighting for your rights, your freedoms to do what you want, how is that different than anyone else? I'm not saying that we shouldn't use our freedom and seek to to, to preserve what freedoms we might have as citizens of this country. But if the outflow of that is just, you can't tell me what to do, I wanna do whatever I want. Isn't that the way everyone lives? Is that really what it means to be different as followers of Jesus? To live differently in a way that makes a difference, I would say, really comes down to this. What comes out of your life? What is the fruit, the outcome of the way that you live? Do you actually see the character of Jesus on display in your life, in your conduct? When life is frustrating, how do you respond? Do you see the character of Jesus? That's the difference that makes a difference. Jesus said, every disciple, no disciple is above his teacher, but every disciple when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. We are hoping in Jesus, not just for that day when we stand before him, but to craft us into his image now in this life because we have a calling to represent him. So think about this. We're almost up to a year of going through the book of Matthew. How have you seen the character of Jesus develop in your life over this past year? Remember, at this end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, whoever hears these words of mine and does them is the wise man who built his house on the rock. There's no benefit in just hearing. How are you seeing the character of Jesus developed in your life or even seeing and seeking to tackle those areas where your character is totally different from Jesus's? Practicing repentance. That's a difference that makes a difference. The way that we show love and serve others like Jesus did. Love, Love even for enemies. That's what Jesus said, right? A few weeks back, if you missed it, when Jose Luis was preaching, and he spent the entire time just looking at that phrase in Luke where Jesus says, be merciful as my heavenly Father is merciful. Mercy, that's a difference that makes a difference. Authenticity, not hypocrisy. Guys, listen. If we, as a community of disciples, are known more for the way that we condemn certain people for their sin, but then like harbor and coddle our own, You know what Jesus called that? He called that being a whitewashed tomb. That's not gonna help anybody. But if on the other hand, we go, okay, fine, then let's just condone sin. You can do whatever you want. I'll just accept you however you are. That also doesn't put Jesus on his plate. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't contone or shuck and jive with sin or say you have forgiveness, but you don't have to follow me. You know, he said, repent, come to me. He came like a doctor for the sick, not to leave people in their sickness, but to nurse them to health. Is that what we're seeking to do with our lives? The ultimate difference between the wheat and the weeds becomes evident over time. Do you see the character of Jesus coming out in your conduct? So that's the first one. Live differently, but not separately. Second idea is this, wait. We are called in this in-between time to wait for our true home. To wait for our true home. To live like wheat in the midst of weeds is going to be uncomfortable. It's not supposed to be cozy. It's meant to be full of tension. We're supposed to long for it to be different. We're supposed to not feel fully at home here, but to wait for our full and final home when Jesus returns. Again, it is good that we remind ourselves this world's groaning. There's a new creation coming. The glory of the Lord will be the light in our midst. That's what we're hoping for. Don't put your eggs in all all in the basket of this world right now. Know where your true home is. It is essential that we remind ourselves of this. Again, so we don't get lulled into being complacent or we just get mad and take our ball and go home. We try to find that sense of safety, at homeness, like permanency, 
somewhere, anywhere, but we'll never find it in this life at this time. It's not supposed to feel like our final home here. Again, I heard somebody say at one time that this world is not our home, but it will be. It will be. Our true destiny is in the new creation, the renewed world that Jesus is bringing. And believe me this, you and I will never be fully satisfied with this place or any other place until that day when Jesus brings the kingdom in his fullness. Do you believe that? Do you, do you really believe that? Because again, over the last few years, we have seen many, many people go, I would rather go any place else than here. Again, people move for good reasons, bad reasons, take care of uh, 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 ailing family members, like true. But haven't we like talked with a lot? Haven't we felt ourselves just that sense of, oh my gosh, I'm just tired of living in California. Ugh. I'm tired of living in California. Some place, any place would be better. Would it? <laughs> that was funny. Better for what? For what purpose? To accomplish what? If your mission in life is to live in a place that is more financially and politically comfortable for you, then yeah, why would you stay here? But if your mission is to be light to the world, isn't light supposed to shine in dark places? That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, right? You light a lamp, you don't put it under a basket, you put it in the middle of a dark room because that's where it's needed. I mean, let's be honest. California, Southern California, it's a pretty weedy place to live, isn't it? <laughs> like literally and figuratively. But I would say, again, you're hearing from me, an elder, a shepherd here at Cornerstone, I feel like this is the place where God has called me to. I believe it's the place that God's called you to unless he makes it clear he's calling you somewhere else. When we see the discomfort, when we see evil, when we see just straight foolishness in the world around us, it ought to make us comfortable but not motivate us to leave and go find some property out in the middle of nowhere where 10 generations of our family can, we can all live together and only interact with people when we want to. Let them both grow up together until the harvest. We are meant to live like wheat among weeds. We are meant to live like light in the darkness. And as things in California get only darker and darker, most likely, all the more reason for us to be here. Not to get what we want out of life, but to embrace that tension to represent Jesus, to put him on display here. Does it mean we have to like the way things are going? No. Agree with it? No, we can. That would be the place, case any place you go. Will we be tempted to complain and grumble and do so via social media and like everybody else's comments that's grumbling and complaining about people on social media? Does that do anyone any good? You know, actually, one of the most important ways that we can shine light in dark places is actually by not complaining and grumbling. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians 2. Oh, where'd it go? It's gone. I will read it to you instead. Here it is. Philippians 2, verses 14 through 16. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. We live within a crooked and twisted generation, but the way we show light is by the way we don't give in to the temptation to grumble and complain about everything that we could. But instead, the way he says it there in verse 16, we hold fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, when he returns to make all things new, it will be revealed. We didn't do this thing in vain. It wasn't empty. It wasn't just something we did to fill a Sunday morning and just went about our life after that. I believe that this passage is calling us to embrace our calling to be light 
here, to be wheat among this weedy soil. Let's not grumble and complain. Let's entrust ourselves to our master who says this is exactly the kind of place that we should be in order to represent him well. And then let's actually make our lives about representing him. Let's actually make our lives about not Jesus as a little add-on to our plans, but positioning ourselves to learn from Jesus, to be led by him, to become like him, to help others do the same. Let's be serious about discipleship. You cannot be faithful to Jesus and abandon his mission to live like wheat among weeds. Let's embrace it, y'all. Let's also hold out the hope that our master is still the one who can change even the hardest soil. He can change even the weediest weed to be healthy, wholesome wheat. He can do it. He can change hearts, amen? If you're a follower of Jesus, you know it because he did it with you. You weren't born into this. God opened your eyes. He gave you ears to hear and eyes to see. So I'd say this to you. If you're here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, Listen, hear, see, turn, and trust, and follow Jesus. Bend your knee to the king. Again, this passage, like we've seen throughout the book of Matthew, confronts us with two really unpopular realities. There's only two paths. We don't like that. We don't like being stuck with two options. But Jesus says there is this broad, easy way you could take that. But it leads to destruction. I don't want you to go that way. There's this narrow path. It's hard. It's difficult. But it leads to life. In the end, there's only two kingdoms you can be a part of. You are either a child of the kingdom of God or you're a child of the evil one. Right now, the distinction between that is murky and confusing. But one day it will be clear. The harvest will come. Jesus will separate. The determining factor is what you do in response to this message today. So if you would like to pray with someone or talk about what it means to follow Jesus, there'll be some of us over here in the prayer room that would love to pray with you. We're gonna sing one last song together called Cornerstone that says, when Jesus comes with trumpet sound, I wanna be found in him, not with dressed in my own righteousness, but his. I wanna be one. He comes back and goes, you're one of mine. Come into the barn. Come home, fully, finally home. We won't be content until then, but we have work to do, amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for your word. It challenges us to our core, and it should. Holy Spirit, you have begun a new work in us. You have stirred something in us that shows us this world is in our home. The way that things are right now isn't where we find our identity and our place of belonging. Lord, would you forgive us for the times when we entertain the notion that any place would be better, any situation, any marriage, any job would be better than where we are. Would you instead give us those eyes to see that in each situation there is the opportunity to put you on display in hard places. You came as light to the world to go to the dark places. You're calling us to join you and do the same. At the same time, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We want to be home. We want to be at rest with you. But we know you're not done gathering people to your name. You're not done changing weeds into wheat. Would you use us here in this place, come what may, for your glory until you return. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.